Hey, what's up, Fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily, and today I have a jam packed podcast episode for you. So let's get right into it. It has been a very long time, I feel like, since I have actually filmed a podcast episode. And so there have been four finished objects, a couple works in progress, and a lot of acquisitions since I last sat down to sort of do this type of format. So we're going to get started with something that you would have seen in the last podcast episode almost finished, which is now completely finished. This is my home chemisole test knit for Sabina of Kadri, and I talked about this at pretty great length in my last podcast episode. So I'll just sort of reiterate some of the details now, uh, but this pattern is out which is really exciting. So this pattern is written for a DK weight yarn, but I got gauge with a single strand of Holskern Super Soft with a needle size that was actually a quarter millimeter down. So this is actually knit on four millimeter needles, DK weight, and I used 3.75 millimeter needles with a light fingering weight. And I think I got a very nice light and drapey fabric. It's not really squishy or cozy uh, like you might expect to get with like a cashmere DK weight, which the pattern is written for, but I think it came out beautifully. I am five foot eight. I weigh about 155 pounds. I have a 37 inch bust, a 28 inch waist, and I knit a size medium. I did get gauge, like I said, but somehow this turned out quite a bit bigger than I was expecting it to. And I think it's because the armholes are quite deep the way the pattern is written. So what I would suggest is either, if you want a shorter armhole, knit a size down and then cast on extra stitches at the underarm to get a better bust circumference to match the fit you want. Or you can use smaller needles when you pick up and knit the I-cord edging. And you can pick up fewer stitches for the I-cord edging. The thing you would want to be weary of in that case is if you're getting a gauge that's a lot smaller than whatever this sort of slope is naturally here, you might get some like weird puckering of the fabric because the I-cord is too small for the armhole um but that was just sort of an observation i made i'm going to leave mine as is because if i wear this with like a lace bralette or a sports bra underneath it kind of peeks through a bit and i think that is a sweet look for the summertime but if you do prefer to sort of have things be a bit more covered up that is how i would accommodate for it I did also say last time that there was like a weird sort of interval between some of the sizes where the difference in bust circumference between the small and the medium was a lot less than the difference between the medium and the large. Like sometimes the jump was a couple inches and then sometimes the jump was like four inches, which uh, can make sizing a little challenging. So I did reach out to Sabina and I was like, I noticed this. Uh, can the pattern include recommendations for potential mods that will help people get the desired fit if they are, especially if they are between sizes. And she has included that in the final pattern, which I am really excited to say. I have worn this quite a bit already and I have really, really enjoyed it. And I think I will probably knit more, maybe in some summery fibers, 
maybe actually in a DK weight. We'll see uh, about my gauge situation, but I think this is a really beautiful, simple closet staple, a great knitwear piece. The V is also a little deep in the front, I should add. So, I mean, another accommodation could just be to like knit less strap, I should say. So, fabulous pattern, the Home Camisole by Kadri. I had a lot of fun test knitting this. It was a tight timeline, but I got it done. I got the photos taken and I think it's great. I love this really neutral truffle colorway from Holstgarn because it is heathered with sort of blue undertones and lighter browns. So, too many good things to say about this. I am wearing my next finished object and you would not have seen this as a whip or an idea or like anything. This is really kind of out of the blue because I did knit it in a week. Um, Aro from Aro Knits and Pearls posted her sort of summer knitwear collection video recently and she had made a top very very similar to this. So sort of to explain the situation with this, the pattern is the Mira or Mira which is designed by Elizabeth Smith but it is sold through Quince & Co. So when Aro showed this top on her channel she disclosed like she, she she gave the name of the designer and all of that um and for folks who don't know even before i began knitting there was a situation with quince and co where designers were coming forward um with their experiences of unethical hiring practices uh from quince and co and sort of their experience being mind for design work and ideas and marketing work and ideas uh, without being given fair compensation or credit. I really don't know much more beyond that, um, but because of that there have been either mixed feelings about Quince & Co, people who have chosen to no longer support Quince & Co, um, etc. So when Aro showed this top in a very, very, very similar red color, I was like, oh my gosh, I have a red yarn just like that, that I've been really, really struggling to find a project for. I have a few really summery yarns in my stash. This is Barocco Modern Cotton, which is like a cotton rayon blend. Um, and I just always had like ideas for what to do with it but none of them really inspired me enough to like act on it and knit the item and this did. So when I went to purchase the pattern that is when I saw that it was a Quince & Co pattern. Um, I knew that Aro had knit this in a Quince & Co yarn because that was the context in which she was talking about Quince & Co um, but like you'll notice on Ravelry um, where a pattern has been published is a separate line from the name of the pattern designer. Um, so I went into the Ravelry page and I saw that the designer was Elizabeth Smith, but the publisher was Quince & Co. And so I was kind of like, mm, maybe I don't want to buy this pattern. So I looked at it more carefully. I looked at all of the project photos and I realized that really it's just, it's, it's garter stitch and rows of yarn over eyelets. And obviously this has a significant amount of positive ease. I knit this to be more of like a beach cover up vibe. So I just said, you know what? I'm not gonna buy the pattern. I'm just going to see if I can as closely as possible replicate it. I'm not going to talk much more about what I did because it is a paid for pattern and I do want to respect that, but it was my choice not to sort of put my money toward a company whose practices I'm not really certain about or agreeing with. The red color I enjoy, obviously, because as I said, it's just like straight up garter and eyelets. I didn't do any shaping, which is why I'm getting this weird 
Like there's no short rows, so it kind of does this funky tenting thing. It doesn't really have any shoulder shaping, nothing like that. Really just like a small little sleeve or like small little border to turn what is effectively a rectangle <laughs> into a sleeve. So I did enjoy knitting this because I knit it on a super open gauge. The Barocco Modern, Modern Cotton is very, very pleasant to knit with. So I enjoyed the experience of actually knitting with it, but because it is such an open gauge, I was using quite thick needles. So I did occasionally struggle with splitting the yarn with my needle, but again, because it was such an open gauge and the eyelets come out pretty massive, this flew by. I started it and finished it within a week. Excuse me. Started and finished it within a week. I think the color is like really fun and bright and summery. I think it'll look nice with, well, I just have my, my, some, my little secret crop by Jessie made underneath, but like really anything underneath. Like I said, I did make this specifically to be a swim cover up, uh, but I could easily see myself wearing this with a skirt, a pair of jeans, very sweet, very simple. Yes, finished object number two, my sort of Mira inspired t-shirt. Finished object number three is also something that you've seen before. And this has been a long time coming. I finished my second Selena sock. So I'll show you the first one as well. Uh, a while back, I test knit this sock for my friend Nicole, who is Professor Pearl. Uh, this sock was her first design ever, and it is sort of loosely inspired by a character in one of her favorite book series. Uh, and I was really keen to test knit this because one of my 2022 knitting goals, or like the, one of the projects I wanted to try was a textured sock. Um, so this sort of met that requirement, but it was also super fast because it's a DK weight sock. So what I did for this pair of socks was I held one strand of Rosa Pomar Retrosaria Mondim, uh, which is 100% Portuguese wool, with one strand of mohair. So I used just like the straight up red color of the Retrosaria Mondim, and then the mohair that I used, which you might be able to tell, is darker. It's a more burgundy color from its Gepard Garn, their Kid Seta, which is my favorite mohair. So these socks are so luxurious. I've only ever like tried on the one that's actually blocked, but it feels really, really, really comfy. Um, I didn't really rush the second sock because, you know, right now it's June. Um, I'm not really wearing mohair socks. So um, I was just kind of working on this between projects when I felt like I needed the feel of mohair, but didn't really want to work on something too big or mind intensive because this is a very, very beautiful, but very simple modified broken rib kind of stitch pattern, I would call it. So really pleasant experience, honestly, knitting this Selena sock by Professor Pearl. Now I've got a pair and I just need to wait for it to get cold again to wear them. My final sort of finished object that's going to transition us to whips is a vanilla sock. So I have one sock done so far. I love this color. So this is a vanilla sock. Like I said, uh, I am knitting this sock or this pair of socks on a pair of Chowgu nine inch circulars. This is a 2.5 millimeter pair. Um, 
Previously, I had a 2.25 millimeter pair, which I sadly lost on public transit. And when I went to replace them, I thought I had 2.5s. And then I found notes somewhere and I realized I actually had 2.25s. So I have a slightly thinner fabric than my other socks or like a less tight gauge than some of my other socks. But what I did was instead of a 64 stitch, I knit a 60 stitch sock. So I've got a one by one rib, 20 row cuff, a 50 row leg, a really, really basic slip stitch heel, simple heel turn, and then I knit 50 rows for the foot. And I did a very simple, I believe this is called a wedge toe, where you're just doing your decreases on either side of the foot. What's really exciting about this sock is obviously the yarn. This is Nicobar Pigeon, which is from Songbird Yarn and Fibers. She's a yarn dyer in Stratford, Ontario, and all of her colorways are inspired by birds, which is wonderful. And she also donates a lot of her proceeds to organizations that support education around sort of the avian population, as well as conservation efforts. So I, I, I think this is just such a cool colorway. When I first showed this to you, I sort of explained in the skein how I liked it because it really had a little bit of everything. And you can sort of see it is very purple forward, but there's certainly green and blue and orange throughout this colorway. And I like that it's variegated without being like super, super stripey and without any significant areas of color pooling. I think this is a really, really beautiful colorway. I will say it does seem that the foot has some more color intensity than the leg up here. Not 100% sure if that's just the way the light is hitting it. Maybe, because then if I do this, Maybe it's just more vibrant centrally, and then if I move it away, it kind of gets blown out. I think that's I think that's it. But anyway, one vanilla sock done. I have a size 10 foot. I have a very big foot. That's why the sock looks huge. It is huge. <laughs> so there's the first one done. I finished the gusset on the second one this morning, and I am just plugging away. This has been really good TTC or like public transit knitting for me lately because it is just like fingering weight, really, really small project. I haven't done socks very focused since whenever I test knit the first Selena sock. Um, really finishing up that second one was just a matter of like 10 rows of the foot and then the toe. So I really haven't done socks since early in the year and it was nice to get back into it. So again, this is Nico Bar Pigeon from Songbird Yarn and Fiber. And when I finish this sock, I have the Blue Jay colorway wound up and ready to go for a pair of socks for my dad, which I'm excited to make for him. He has small feet for a man very similar to my sized foot actually. So uh, my plan is to let him try on my sock. And then if he likes the fit of that, just do the exact same recipe or make really minor adjustments. Like maybe he'll need a 64 stitch uh, width, but length will probably work out the same, which is why I knit my own sock first, just to sort of have that reference point. Um, but I know this colorway is probably going to end up being more stripey than this one. So I'm excited. It's vibrant. It's cool. It's kind of got this like icy blue, royal blue vibe. I think the Blue Jays were doing pretty well this year. So that's an upcoming whip, not really a whip, but it's in the project bag. I thought um, my partner and I had sort of like a cottage weekend with some of our friends for the July long weekend. Um, and I was pretty ambitious. I was like, I'm gonna finish this sock and I'm gonna cast on my dad's sock. 
but I really knit less than 10 rounds the entire five days, four days. So <laughs> it was ambitious, but I was ready. I was prepared. Better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it, right? So that was finished object slash whip. And now we have, I feel like, sped through the projects. I am going to tell you about a good chunk of acquisition. <laughs> um, so the first couple of things are from a weekend sort of adventure I had with one of my friends a few weeks ago. Um, my friend Alexandra has a YouTube channel about books. She talks about what she's been reading, reviews, um, really, really cool themes sometimes. She has this one episode on like unhinged girlies in literature and about how like women's mental health and well-being and the treatment of women are portrayed in in literature um, and nonfiction as well, books about sort of women's mental health. Um, but anyway, she suggested we go downtown to check out a couple used bookstores, uh, which we used to do a lot when we were in high school. So I was definitely in and I picked up a couple of novels, but I was really amped to find this. So this is Glorious Colors, Sources of Inspiration for Knitting and Needlepoint with 17 Projects by Keith Facet and Photography by Steve Lovey. When I was checking out, so when I found this at the bookstore and I was checking out, the lady or the person who was at the register was just kind of like flipping through and she was like, oh my goodness, I love the colors in this book. And I was like, yeah, Kay Facet's kind of like, as far as I know, an icon in in terms of knitting. And so realistically, I am not going to knit or needlepoint the vast majority of what's in this book, if anything at all. But the color inspiration is just absolutely insane. It's so striking. It's not really something I would ever think to look to for inspiration, I think just the fact that, you know, it's K Facet. I found it in a used bookstore. It, it kind of feels like a little treasure to me. So I'm going to show you a few, few pages from the book to help like communicate, communicate to you. Let's there's still some glare uh, but anyway to help communicate to you how stunning this book is the way this book is written it's sort of broken down into categories so there's like let's see there's like stripes there's a section on stripes there's a section on spots and dots squares and patches fanciful flora, stars and diamonds. So the sections are just super, super, very, very inspired as well. So it's inspired and inspiring. And I do think they're distinct. Like look at this leopard print shawl and the fringe that's on it. That is like absolutely jaw dropping, stunning, amazing. I don't know, one of my, I think, Ooh, I don't know if that shawl pattern is in here. Not all of the patterns that are shown are actually in the book, but they're just like really cool to look at. The one thing that was in here that I was really, really sad was not part of the book is the carpet coat. There was a whole spread on the carpet coat, which is a beautiful design by Kay Facet. Here, here's the spread. You can see this like up, upper corner here is the carpet coat. Anna from Brook Willow has knit this coat. And so I think the pattern is in Glorious Knits, the other book, one of the other books by Kay Facet. Um, not this one in particular. There's even just like the knits are in the background, but then the foreground is this like dishware that sort of 
echoes the pattern in the knits. It's just, I would just leave this out as a coffee table book, honestly. It is so gorgeous and like unique. I've never seen anything like this before. It's like a mix of history and culture and knitting and like all the good things that make me really excited. There's, there's Kate. So I was really, really happy to find this. For $4.99, I could not leave it behind. I took it with me. The rest of my acquisitions are yarn. There's four separate acquisitions. So from the same day that I was out with my friend Alexandra, we were on Bloor Street West and you knit, E-W-E knit, is a Toronto yarn shop located on Bloor Street West. So we popped in and I wanted to pick up, first of all, my nine inch circulars, my Chiaogu replacement needles. Um, but I've also had in my mind for a while now this idea for a pair of socks that is like a cream colored fingering weight sock yarn held with mohair but like the mohair is used to make like stripes or or just like held like I just want to use a whole bunch of mohair scraps and I thought it would be fun to do a mohair sock but I, I thought to combine the most colors, it would be, make most sense to have a really neutral base. So I wanted to pick up the yarn for those socks and I picked Sandus Garn Sisu. And I didn't notice until I got home that I had picked up two different colors. I have white and cream, which I think makes sense. Um, each of these were six fifty, and the balls are fifty grams and have a hundred and seventy five meters in them. So I've heard good things about this sock yarn. I've heard that it's like very durable. A lot of people like it for color work socks a lot. My friend Rachel from Night Sky Knitting does not like this yarn because she's a left-handed knitter and she untwists it. But I am a right-handed knitter, so. I don't expect to have that issue. I just need to see now if I will be able to squeeze a pair of socks out of one of these balls, or if I will need to do like the cream color for the cuff, heel, and toe, and then the white color for everything else, or if I can do like warm colored mohairs with the cream and then cool colored mohairs with the white and have like a mismatched pair of socks. I would prefer not to go buy another ball of yarn. The shop is a little out of the way for me. So um, let me know what you think I should do with these. If I should just make them really wacky and wild and eclectic, see if I can squeeze two socks out of one ball or try to do like a really subtle contrasting heel toe cuff. Sandus Garden Sisu. I'm looking forward to working with this, but it's not really a priority for me. I just, we were there. I wanted it. I picked it up. My next two yarns are actually the same yarn, just different colorways. I recently ordered a whole bunch of Knit Picks palette. So I have, like I said, two colors. I got Iris Heather, which is this, it's getting blown out, but it's like a warm toned purple with beige and reds sort of heathered throughout it. And I got Oregon Coast, which is a beige with blues and greens and oranges heathered throughout it. I got six balls of this and I got 13 balls of this. I had previously like ignored Knit Picks palette. I like Knit Picks yarns. I've knit with a handful of different ones now, but I think I had just skipped past palette many times because I thought it was an acrylic blend or it was fully acrylic, but it's actually 100% wool. It is a fingering weight yarn. It's very similar in my opinion to Holstgarn Super Soft, which is also like a two-ply, a two-ply fingering weight yarn, but this is a bit heavier. The Holstgarn gives you like 250 
meters and like 280 yards per ball and this is less where is it I think it's like 200 I'm kind of rattled oh there it is <laughs> 231 yards per 50 grams so this is like a heavier a heavier fingering maybe a light sport um but I was just starting to think about project planning for the fall and realizing that all of my knit sweaters, my hand knit sweaters have mohair in them. Um, and I'm planning to knit the Hour Pullover by Sari Nordland, which is also going to be, um, it's knitting for olive merino and soft silk mohair held together. So um, I was trying to think of what I wanted to knit this fall and I wanted something that is just a mohairless sweater. Mohair is very, very hot. There's a time and place for it, but sometimes it's just a bit too warm. Um, and I found this this Heather colorway, and I thought it was just really, really beautiful, very striking. If you've been around for a while, you would know that I knit my very first like proper sweater uh, with a really nice purple heathered yarn. It was the Sunday sweater by Petite Knit, uh, but I just used the wrong yarn substitution. It was too heavy, too much twist, really, really chunky, not like fluffy and airy. That Sunday sweater is Knit and Snuff Nug by Camarosa, which is like a blown yarn. So it's super light and airy and fluffy. And that just was like, not it. It hanged really, really weird on my body. I don't wear the sweater. Um, anyway, I was really craving purple. So, I mean, I knit the purple sock. This is going to be purple. I have more purple to show you. Um, but I thought this color was really beautiful. I think because it's a warm tone purple, it'll suit my skin tone quite well. And so I'm planning to make the Louvre sweater by Petite Knit with this yarn. And I'm very much looking forward. Like, I really want to cast this on right away. I know that might be, like, a bad idea because it's just the start of July. We have yet to reach the hottest part of our summer here in Toronto. But this is, like, soft. It feels squishy. It kind of feels like it's one of those yarns that's just going to get better with use. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to working with palette from Knit Picks. This Oregon Coast colorway is also one that I think flatters my skin tone very well. It's a darker beige than what I have selected for my Hour Pullover by Sari Nordland. But I'm thinking for this, I want to make a pretty loose gauge fingering weight sweater. So maybe something like the classic, the cozy classic Raglan Light by Jessie Made Designs or the I think the Lento pullover from Lina. Um, Rebecca from the Crea Bay is currently knitting that and it looks really just like nice, easy staple. Uh, but the plan for this is subject to change. I think I've saved the best acquisition, the best yarn acquisition for last, maybe. Uh, my favorite things knitwear is soon to be coming out with her camisole number seven, which is looking like her most bra friendly of the camisoles. I have knit camisole number two, camisole number four, and camisole number five, uh, but I'm very much excited for camisole number seven because it looks quite bra friendly and most of the summer tops that I have knit uh, are wool. My home camisole is wool. My Vegas top is wool. My camisole number five is wool. My camisole number four is linen, cotton, and tencel. This is cotton and rayon. Um, but I recently thrifted a linen button-down shirt and I really liked how the linen felt. And I was just thinking about, you know, I'd probably want to knit camisole number seven. It's a beautiful, beautiful pattern. 
but I don't want to do another summer top design in a wool or animal based fiber. So I did a little bit of research into what kinds of linen yarns are available. Sandiskarn has Lina and Tin Lina, but that is only like 10% linen. There's not a lot of linen in that yarn, I think. It's mostly cotton and I think also Tencel. I'll fact check myself on this. Uh, but Lina and Tin Lina from Sandiskarn are not 100% linen. Um, Nitpicks has Kotlin, which is a DK weight cotton linen blend. May also have Lindy Chain, which is a heavy fingering weight, 100% linen yarn with a chain like construction or a chainette construction. And then I looked at what the Knitting Loft carried. They had a whole bunch of the Quince and Co yarns, but I didn't want to purchase those. Uh, I think. Oh, now I'm not going to remember the name of the yarn. I think it's Camarose has a also chainette constructed 100% linen yarn. But when I was looking at that, although the price was quite good, the chainette construction for the linen yarn concerns me a bit because the strands are very, very fine. And I would worry that if I broke any of the strands in the chainette with my needle or they just frayed with wear or something like that, that it would kind of look raggedy really fast. I think one of the advantages of linen fiber is that it is such a long fiber. So it has a lot of strength and durability to it. And so I would want my yarn choice to be constructed in a way that reflects that property. That being said, I don't actually know much about the structural integrity of chainette construction yarns. But anyway, I ultimately decided that I wanted to purchase the Antigone or Antigone yarn from Durarum Natura. So this was I'll admit the priciest option of all of the yarns out there, but I've acquired a good amount of yarn recently because I have done, I think, a very good job of knitting from stash and knitting down stash this year. Um, so anyway, not that I have to justify this choice. Uh, I picked out the colorway Prunel, which I assumed meant plum, but then I looked it up and it said it meant pupil, as in like pupil of the eye, but it is this like gray, purple, brownish kind of color mix. And I think this yarn is beautiful. It looks very, very shiny because again, the linen fibers are very long and when they're twisted tightly together, like they are here, then the light reflects off of them very, very nicely. And I was talking with uh, Bruna, who owns the Knitting Loft. She's one of the people who, like one of the people who owns the shop. Um, I was saying like it was quite difficult. I know I just listed off a whole bunch of linen yarns, but compared to 100% wool, it's hard to find 100% linen yarn. And she was explaining to me that um, Dererum Natura had told the Knitting Loft that the next time they'll be able to get stock of specifically Antigone is not going to be until spring of 2023. I think it was not a very good growing year for linen, which significantly impacted the amount of stock that Dererum Natura was able to produce. Uh, and so across all of the stockists of Durarum Natura and specifically Antigone, um, they're just able to carry less. Uh, and so I felt really lucky to actually have been able to find and purchase the yarn that I wanted because I could not find any other local yarn shops that had the that had the Antigone. So this is probably going to be cast on as soon as the English version of Camisole number seven comes out. 
I purchased three balls of it. I think that might be more than I needed. Uh, but if that indeed ends up being the case, then maybe I'll make like a headscarf or something with the linen. That would be, I think, very nice. Or a project bag, like not a project bag, a produce bag, because linen is so strong. It'd be kind of cute to have like a little matching set. So that's everything that I had to share with you today. I feel like, especially because of the acquisitions, it's just been, and, and the socks actually, it's been a lot of like small things that have accumulated quite significantly over the past little while, uh, sort of compiled or compounded or like add that to the fact that I've been doing a lot of videos lately, but not really a lot of podcasts. So we've been busy here at High Fiber Knits, but it's been a moment since I've done a podcast. This was, I think, good for me to kind of get it out of my system, I guess. I don't know if, if you have a knitting podcast, do you ever feel like when things sort of start to accumulate, it sort of takes up space in your mind and then you film a podcast and it's like those things are cleared from your brain and it's kind of a relief. I hope that's not just me because it's really not like a burden. It's so much fun, but you know, I think you sort of develop an instinct for when you should film a podcast like what's an appropriate amount of stuff to show. And this was a lot for me, I think. So if you've made it this far, <laughs> thank you for hanging out. I appreciate the time that you've spent with me here today. And until I get to see you again, I'm wishing you all health and happy knitting. Bye everyone.